So, uh, I'm Nathan, and I work here at SOAS. You probably haven't seen me that much because I was away for a year. But uh, Sandy can't be here. So, I want to thank Sandy for allowing this extraordinary talk in the sense of not on the usual time. Uh, but in any case, uh, with that, I'll introduce Matis. This is Matis List, Dr. Johan Matis List, who comes to us from uh, the CNRS in Paris. Uh, and his uh, magister, our bike, was in. Indo-European linguistics, and then he did a PhD on fancy computer things. Uh, and now in, <laughs> in Paris, uh, he works both actually at the, the East Asian linguistics research spot in the CNRS, and then also uh, with some biologists. And he recently got, uh, and you congratulate him, uh, an ERC star grant. Uh, where he will be using computational methods to uh, reconstruct the proto sign of uh, And uh, the intention is that this will be based at the Max Planck Institute for Human History in uh, Jena, which you, uh, you may know about because it recently started and has a certain amount of attention. Anyhow, and, and, oh, and we're working together on another ERC uh, research project that is based here at SOAS, uh, as well as the British Library and the British Museum about the reconstruction of Proto Burmish, which you may touch on in the talk, I'm not sure. So sure. No, no, not so much. <laughs> okay. uh, so, so then I'll just read the talk title uh, Beyond Cognacy uh, Historical Relationships Between Words and Their Implications for Phylogenetic Reconstruction. Okay, yeah, thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. We have been working the whole week. Uh, yeah, sure. We have been talking the whole week about uh, working on. The Burmish reconstruction, now it goes back to Chinese because uh, I talked beyond cognacy, but uh, only about Chinese as a, as a main point. So it was my minor at university and then this project I'm pursuing at the moment in Paris, which is called Later and Vertical Aspects of Chinese Dialect History. And we have been trying to investigate the, the development of the Chinese dialects, specifically uh, concentrating on lexical evolution or on the lexical change of the word um, across the dialect. So what I'm referring to here is actually based on a paper that was recently published with the Journal of Language Evolution, the newly established journal with Oxford University Press. And what I have been, uh, but I have included some other stuff because only taking it said it would be, I thought it might be too boring, so I tried to put some more things into it. And um, I will start by saying some little things about the background. And we know that our languages change, as Albert Schleicher already said, as long as they exist, new words get Create, and even old words get lost, new words get created, and even the pronunciation of words changes slowly over time. When the speakers of the two language varieties separate, their speech keeps changing independently. When the changes may become so great that they can no longer communicate, and what was once one language has now become two. That is um, our simple background. And even closer to that one is 200 years ago, scholars were um, started to get aware of the fact that languages can actually change and can be related. And these were scholars like Asmus Rask and Jakob Blim, who prepared languages like Icelandic, uh, Latin, Old Greek, and Sanskrit, which are not in the same regions, spoken in really various different geographical regions, but they realized that these go back to one common source. And this is how it all started with comparative linguistics. And they established a new method for language comparison, which is based on intensive comparison of languages, and, and they tries to identify regular the recurrent similarities to prove language relationship and to reconstruct the development of language families. This um, is the comparative method, and due to the comparative method, we have now gained many new insights into language history. But first, let us go back again to the roots of um, how we model language history. And then the first thing, uh, the first person to mention would be August Schleicher, because August Schleicher was the one who first said that. If you look at the language data, at the comparative data on the languages, on the results of our comparative method, on the method that we apply to compare these languages, we need to illustrate them by the image of a branching tree, by Bilder eines sich verästelnden Baumes. And then he would draw his first language tree. This is the oldest one we can find from 1853 by August Schleicher. And what we are doing so here, just it is a little bit small. Here you see Deutsche, Letto, Slavo, so it's only German. Slavo Germane, Ario Belaga, Indo German, and Shu. But uh, what is striking, what I think is really funny about this tree is, is it's a German oak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 
It looks like a German op. So we don't see anything of the ditches we see nowadays where the people make their final genetic reconstruction. We see little things and the mathematical trees, but Schleicher was really thinking of a tree, apparently. <laughs> but um, this, this phase of dendrophilia, as one might call it, um, this didn't last long in linguistics because linguists tend to be skeptical all the time. And then, <laughs> and over 20 years later, Johannes Schmidt was writing this book in, uh, from uh, 1872 where he said, you can turn it as you want, as long as you stick to the idea that in historically the historically attested languages have been developed by multiple formations of the access to language, that is, as long as you assume that there is a Stammbaum, a family tree of the Indian European languages, you will never be able to explain all facts which have been asserted in a scientifically satisfying way. So he was um, really obsessed with science, and then he came up with his theory that is now like quoted all over the place, where he said, and this is uh, what usually people mean when they talk, when they quote Johannes Schmidt as the father of a wave theory, he said, I want to replace the tree by the image of a wave that spreads out from the center in concentric circles, circles becoming weaker and weaker, the farther they get away from the center. The problem is, Johannes Schmidt never showed how the wave theory would look. So while Schleicher gave us the German own, Johannes Schmidt didn't give us much. So in his paper, um, 1872, in the book, there's nothing. There's no visualization. And um, 1875, he's trying to make the same point, and then he's trying to confirm that there is no tree, and then he's giving us this visualization. And this is actually nothing else than a pie chart, with a slight exception here. Here you see that he gives the Polar Polish speakers, here the Bulgarian speakers, here Russian and the as he calls it, the Kleinrussen, I think he's talking about um, right, uh, yellow Russian there, and then here, uh, so these are the Slavic languages represented in the wave theory. The problem that I personally have with the wave theory is that I don't know what this is supposed to tell me. <laughs> because I don't see any history in here. And if we compare what people afterwards claimed to be the best visualization, or a good visualization of the wave theory, be it Nehi, who did the same Nice little, nice little pie chart, as Johannes Schmidt had been doing. B. Bloomfield, who started to, I think, was one of the first to use the isoglose boundaries, on, as, at least on larger language families. Here, who was using multiple Venn diagrams, or one function, who was using a network. Um, that is started. I don't see any dynamics in here, I don't see any history in here. And I think it's worth to go back to another scholar. So, first, make a little summary. Why? So trees are better, I agree with that. I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not really, they're, they're difficult to reconstruct. We don't see the trees because of all the forest of trees of possibilities that we have there. Languages do not always split. I also, I agree with that. It's, it's really, that is the problem of the trees. And trees are also boring because they model the, only the vertical aspects of language history. They only model splits, but we don't know what was going on in the tree. But the same, in my opinion, applies to waves because nobody knows how to reconstruct them, because think languages still diverge even if not necessarily in split processes, and they are boring since they only want to have resentful aspects of languages if any. And here it is useful to go back to Hugo Schuchat, who then in um, 1870, but it was only published late in 1900, um, had this statement in one, in one sentence was an introductory lecture that he gave when he entered the university. I think it was in Leipzig, but I'm not sure at the moment. So where he said, we connect the branches and twigs of the tree with countless horizontal lines, and it ceases to be a tree. So he was writing a paper against the tree, but here he was showing actually what he meant. We have a tree and we connect the branches, then it ceases to be a tree, but it's not a rain, it's a net. And that's why I think networks are a better way to unify this process. That is actually what I also was trying, I'm trying to do in the project I'm pursuing at the moment in, in Chinese, to take all the different aspects into account, to, um, to model language, uh, uh, language history more realistically. But now we have a problem, and this is actually now going from, I won't show you any networks on the Chinese dialects because I couldn't do that because there was another problem. If we look at lexical change, and we look at, for example, the Indian European word for sun, and we have two possible, and the people reconstruct the word for sun by claiming that there was an irregular paradigm in the Indian European language in which the oblique cases were represented by the green one here, so the genitive or something was a nos, 
with the genitive ending, so the we thing, and the nominative and accusative were represented by so So we have an alternation between na and lo in this word very word already in the ancestral language. So how does this pattern work then in the descended languages? In Germanic, it needs to be retained because in Germanic we have the same pattern but differently resolved in German and Swedish. So in German we have Sonne, in Swedish we have Su. So this doesn't give us any other possibility than to assume that the pattern was still present in Proto-Germanic. If we go to Romance, we know that it was already lost. The people only have Sol, this, or something with the ending, then Sol in, 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 um, in Proto-Romance. In French, actually, at the same time, they would develop another word, Soliculus. And this word actually then led to the French word for Soleil. So we have some morphology change going on here. And in Spanish, we have the word as it was more or less in Latin language. This shows that we have some patterns which are quite complicated. We have morphological change, we have a semantic shift also going on from whatever. If it's a diminutive and it says something like small sun, then it goes back and shifts and uh, or whatever was going on here, so we call it semantic shift that is going on. We have a complex interaction, even though although we have a tree here, because this is a tree, there's nothing going on. So the variation that is actually leading to problems is internal. And this is the variation I want to talk about today. This is the question of beyond cognitive. Now, but just let us try to be a bit more precise about lexical change. And in lexical change, people usually start from Saussure. We can always start from Saussure and say we have the article and the image of an article, so the tree and the tree. And we have the form and the meaning as the two sides of this linguistic side. However, this is not like the coin and the two sides of the coin, as you said, but it is more complicated. We should not forget that it's not more complicated, but it's just we should not forget that we're talking about a language. And it's a triangle. It's better to think of it as a triangle because the language is important. If I only have a meaning attached to a form, it doesn't say anything unless I know which language I'm speaking. And um, if we go for this, we have three ways by which lexical change can happen. Lexical change can happen along the form, so the form can change through morphological change. It can change along the language, and this is actually something where I would say it switches from one language to another, so this would be borrowing or contact induced phenomena, and it can change along the meaning. This makes actually more or less complete in the things as in this example that I gave for Sun. And here, Gibal Dunn in 2007, he Use this schema in order to show that um, to show the different variations of, as he called it, different dimensions of lexical change: stratic change, as he calls it, semantic change, and morphological change. And here are just a few examples. So we have the old High German word for cup, uh, for head. It's cup, and it meant something like a cup. And then now today it means the head, so Kopf. And in standard German, and if we want to uh, make a verb out of it, then we can add a little morphological change and then we have Köpfen and we can use our head to, um, to play football and here we have a borrowing case where we have actually morphological change and from the English word for World Cup we would borrow it into German but we retain the word in the German word so we say Weltcup it's not C cup it's Weltcup um, it's misspelled here and um, so this is just illustrating these different variations now, the other point is, what I'm working on at the moment is quantitative approaches. So, um, and this is actually where biology comes in. Uh, as I'm working in two departments in, um, in Paris, um, with a biologist and with um, cyanologists, um, it, is, um, uh, it is important to talk a little bit about that before I come to the point. Um, historical linguistics and to write and, then Google suggests evolutionary biology. So this will maybe in, um, in, ten uh, in 10 years or maybe never, it will happen, but I just wanted to have something nice in order to show. But uh, you know that recently biological approaches are more and more common and uh, the people say, like, we take biological powerful methods to analyze the languages and tell linguists things that, um, and it's all completely novel, but uh, it's not necessarily completely novel because um, interactions between biology and linguistics go back far. Uh, far long in the history of the two disciplines. And we can even start by looking at, not biology, but at geology, by looking at Lyell's work on the antiquity of man, where he wrote, if, the, if we knew nothing of the existence of Latin, if all historical documents had been lost, if tradition even was silent as to the former existence of a Roman Empire, and then I skip some things here, and the rational 
it would enable us to say, if we compare the languages, that at some time there must have been a language from which these six modern dialects derive their origin in common. What we're talking about here is uniformitarianism, and this is the uniting uh, point, the uniting factor that, the factor that unites the two disciplines, that unites biology, linguistics, but also geology. And the uniformitarianism in uh, the version of Charles Lyell said there's a uniformity of change, laws of change are uniform, they have applied in the past, as they apply now and will apply in the future, no matter at which place. Graduality of change, change proceeds gradually, not abrupt. And the third point was abductive reasoning. We can infer past events and processes by investigating patterns of observed in the present, which become the key to the interpretation of some mystery in the archives of remote ages. And I think this is the main point that we have in common with biologists. We have only observed data that we observe right now, and we try to infer what has been going on in earlier times. But we can also find, if we look at August Schleicher and look at his literature from 1848 up to 1863 in the books, then we find that August Schleicher is saying, repeating the same things. He talks about language change as a gradual process, at least certain aspects of language change, as a law-like process, we know about sound laws in linguistics, historic linguistics, as a natural process which occurs in all languages, so the universality is addressed here, as universal process which occurs in all times. And he also says that it allows us to infer past processes and extinct languages by investigating the languages of the present. We find all this also reflected in linguistics, and I think this was the reason why we found these commonalities between the two disciplines, and why we also use the trees to represent certain kinds of divergence or certain kinds of history. It was not, many people claim nowadays that it was biology that influenced linguistics already by then, already in 1850. Um, August Schleicher saw Darwin's book and afterwards he said, oh, now I need to make trees of uh, linguistics. But you saw that Schleicher's book was from 1853. By then he knew nothing of Darwin's work. He was introduced to Darwin's work according to his own letter that he wrote to Ernst Haeckel. And there he was introduced in 1860 by uh, receiving a translation from Darwin's Origin of Species into German. Then he was reading that and then he was writing a reply to that. So um, before he even said like our trees are actually better than yours because our, our trees are concrete. I can write in the European words there. And um, Darwin only had an abstract schema something ago, because I didn't dare to say anything more. So it was not the direct exchange of ideas that led to the development of similar approaches in biology and linguistics, but the astonishing fact that scholars in both fields would uh, be about at the same time to detect striking parallels between both disciplines, both regarding their theoretical foundations and the processes they were investigating. And linguists were the first to draw trees. That is always important to tell that to the biologists. We have a paper that just came out in Biology Direct. Um, this was collaborative work with the biological department where I work, and there you can see here the trees that were published are trees and networks. Networks, it's really, this is a network, this is, uh, this is a tree-like schema, there's no, but this is actually showing even the commonalities between these dialects here of Germanic dialects. If we go back, we find far before 1700, we find already like first images of um, language div divergence using tree or branching um, tree or network-like patterns. And the first ones come only up 100 years later in biology. So it is, I think if we say like before 1700 and after 1700, then it's like three to zero for bi linguistics against biology at the moment. <laughs> 150 years later, we are in a situation that um, people start, so there is, uh, some linguists have the impression at the moment, and I think it's still, but it will get better during the next years, I think, but um, we have the impression that we have been living in this nice ivory tower here. We've been doing our work on Indo-European and other language families, and we've been working, but all of a sudden, there's this storm of bits and bytes by the biologists, created by biologists, and many people are just afraid that this storm will break apart our nice little ivory tower, but um, the biologists or other people say, so we have actually two groups there, the other people say, no, it will help us that the ivory tower will shine in a new glance and will give us a new bright future. So I think we just, um, by doing it right, I think this is true, but we should not overestimate the possibilities of what biology can offer us, but we should also not underestimate the things that we can learn. So having some reconciliation going on here, and we should not be too humble with our own things that we have been learned during the 200 years of research in historical linguistics. The quantitative turn, you could call it the quantitative turn because it was something like 20 years ago now almost, um, more and more papers turn up 
where they say things like Indo-European and computational cladistics, language trees, classification by numbers, classification of the world's languages, Indo-European tree, and networks. That is uh, one paper where I was involved, that I, was, uh, why I put it there, but I, the quantitative term was way earlier. It was uh, like in the beginning of 2000 that the people would start using linguistic data and biological methods. Um, how does this look? In general, and this brings us actually right to the point what I want to talk about. Um, how does it look? Usually, people start from concept list, from, from Swadesh list. They start a lexical word list. They have a word list, and the word list has some headwords, basic concepts, basic concepts. So we wouldn't compare fridge, a refrigerator, or something like that. We can only compare words where we think they were also present 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. So we take words like hand, blood, head, tooth, to sleep, to say, and then we translate them into a couple of languages, like here, like into German, English, Italian, and French. And then we code them for cognacy. So we code them by saying that German and English are cognate. They go back to the same root in Proto-Germanic. We know what um, we, we, we know the history pretty well, so we just code it in this way. So we give it both the same ID. It's a one here. For blood and blood, it's the same three three. And Italian sangue and uh, French sang is actually also the same four four. So we code them in this way, and the colors just illustrate where we have. Here we have a tooth. It's reflected in all four languages. Now, how do we use this in order to reconstruct something or to do a quantitative analysis? Um, we we tabulate it by showing actually still the basic concept and implicitly we have the knowledge about the protoforms here but this is only implicitly because it's not used in the analysis but you can see that the proto-germanic form which was blue in here is now still blue here and you see the hand and now the question is this form is present in English and in German so in these two languages but is absent in Italian and French so by doing this trick we can actually tabulate the data and have a file that we can actually directly feed into biological software that then tries to infer a tree from that by saying that this pattern gives us some indication that English and German are closely related. And here the blood is the same and we have the same for the other patterns and we can then plot this onto a tree. We take the matrix and then infer whether a new word evolved, was lost or was evolved. In this case people would say the word we have the same pattern here, A, B, C, so we assume that these are all different words and A is present in English and German nowadays, so we say that the word A was involved from Indo-European or whatever we assume was here to the Germanic languages, they gained another word, so they call it a word gain or a word origin. And we also have a lost process here, so in French the word in C was for example lost and so French is left with zero words here. But it's only an example, it's, uh, of course we have more data for that. But this is how it is done, um, basically. So this is the basic uh, idea behind all these processes. What is important here is to look at analogies and parallels. Um, so are we discussing analogies that people just made up because they see things are similar, or are we discussing things that are real? Parallels have been um, often, have, people have proposed that they are like these striking parallels between the processes of historical linguistics, uh, language evolution or language history, as I prefer to call it, and, um, and biological evolution. And they say something like that um, regarding unique of replication, we have species and we have language, and in languages we have a word, a gene versus a word, asexual and sexual reproduction, we have learning, cladogenesis, and language split, and something. But if we really carefully review the similarities here, and we need to ask ourselves whether these are things that we want to see or things that we see. Because if one only looks long enough at two really different objects, one always finds a way to unite them and to make them similar. <laughs> and here the point is there are also many differences between species and languages. So regarding the domain, we are talking about Popper's World 1 here, where we're talking about biological objects, and we're talking about Popper's World 3, so the world of, the world of ideas. This Popper paper is really interesting in this context, but I cannot go into the details here, but it's, um, it's just a nice paper on that. It's uh, 78, I think, um, three words. Uh, Tana lectures on human values, I think, where he, where, he, where he mentioned that. And this language is qualified as Popper's word three. So, mechanical and arbitrary, the relation between form and function, we know. So, Sir told us that the function, the form function thing is arbitrary. And um, in bio biology, it's mechanical. If you have a protein that codes for something, then it's just mechanical process that codes for something else. And um, especially what is Im important is also sequence similarities, universal versus language specific. So, we, words are similar 
with respect to the languages. So um, we cannot have a general similarity between two words. Or we, let's say it wouldn't tell us anything. And the differentiation of languages is definitely not necessarily always tree-like, as we have in most species. They evolve in a tree-like manner in biology, but not in, in, in language history. Difference in the alphabets, quickly to talk about that, because it's always interesting, and it's interesting how uh, it takes a long time to explain biologists that fact. So the alphabets in biology are universal. We have either the four letters um, or the amino acids and uh, nucleic acids, I think. So I'm also not really on. Um, but they have the 20 letters then uh, for, for certain, or the, or the four letters. But in languages, we, we know the phoneme system is something that is defined for a certain language, that there's the distinction inside the language. So it's language specific. If you look at the, then it is limited, but in our case, the, the size of the alphabet is widely varying. We have languages with 50 phonemes and languages with 120 phonemes, or whatever we come up with also, people come up with in their analysis. And um, our alphabets are mutable because they change. We know that the, when a language changed, then it changes certain sounds, and this means that the alphabet changed. So we could even think of, imagine that in the future we will start talking, producing new sounds that have never been used before. Or we could think of a situation that in the past people were using certain sounds that are no longer in use nowadays. So we could think of certain things like that. You could think of similar ideas in biology, but in languages it's much more easy to think of um, scenarios like that. So the uh, difference in the processes uh, here it comes to the to the very point that is a problem of the of the analysis as so people show it nowadays with the gain loss and the loss of words what they call then the gain and loss of cognate sets they make an analogy between between genes and words and they say what they call homologs in biology and cognates and linguistics but this is completely different the term homology was coined by Richard Owen who distinguished homologs as the same organ in different animals under every variety of form and function from analogs as an organ in one animal which has the same function as another part or organ in a different animal so nowadays it commonly denotes the relationship of common descent between any entities without further specification of the evolutionary scenario with respect to specific scenarios of common descent, molecular biologists further characterize relationship between homologous genes by distinguishing orthology, paralogy, and xenology, as they call it. And this is how you could visualize it. So we have something, um, a species here, and then we have a process of speciation where, we, where this gene is then inherited in this point. And now genes can duplicate. So um, they can dupli be duplicated in the same gene and they use the second time for another function. So they will slightly change. So we have two co copies of the same gene in this species at this point by the process of duplication. And if we now look at the relation between A and B, biologists call them parallax. So they're not strictly related, but related via an intermediate process that they call duplication. Now the same is people realized in the 50s when they looked at bacterial evolution and realized that they evolved so fast, we cannot really explain what is going on there, that this must be horizontal. This must involve lateral transfer of genes because otherwise you could not explain that they, that they uh, adapt so fast to new environments. When they detected that, this meant that they need to define another category of relatedness between genes and this is what they call xenologs. So we have a lateral transfer going on from here to there introducing a new gene to this species. And now, if you look at the C, we know that it is a xenolog, xenologous relation with all the other in the extant species. You can easily see or what I've tried in my dissertation in 2014, I have tried to compare this directly and then add terms for linguistics because I thought it's a good idea. So we have direct, indirect involving lateral transfer as a common descent, as, a, as a, we have orthology, paralogy, xenology. In linguistics, when we talk about cognate words, we usually mean the both. We don't make a distinction. We don't make a distinction whether there is something going on that is further changing a word like morphological change, semantic change. We don't care about these cases. Some people say there is something like indirect cognate relation, but this is only um, in the handbook by Trask that I found this. So we have many empty spots also. We don't have a way to directly say these words are completely without any change going on like cognate. And we have no way to actually just denote all the words that are historically related. So what I proposed by then was some new terms, but um, terminology, but this is actually not really important because now later, when preparing the paper, I realized it's not that easy, it's not that simple. So etymological relation, direct cognitive relation, what, what does it mean to be direct? Does it include semantic shift or not? So do we, so actually what we can, what is better and what is now like um, in the paper that I, uh, that was published recently in the Journal of Language Evolution is if we just look at the, at these three things of aspects of lexical change, so stratic, morphological, semantic. 
We have the, th uh, the three aspect um, dimensions of lexical change by Givaudan, as he, as, he, as he mentions them, and then we look what we can have, where can we have uh, variation, and what people actually use. The Cognesi Alas Swadesh, because Maurice Swadesh is the, f is the influential person in the modern applications because the people, they don't use his methodology, but they use his methodology to assemble the data in the first instance. So and in Swadesh terms, he didn't care for morphological unity, so he said it can be different or it can be the same, so I will just still annotate. If I still have a little morpheme that reflects the word, I will say this is cognate with the other thing, although it's um, not really visible. But he cared for semantic unity, so he said everything that is different in semantics, I won't count it for my lexical statistics or for my glottal chronology. And uh, Swadesh was also against borrowing, so he, they, they tried to, um, to rule out borrowings, more or less. Traditional notion of cognacy um, would also would actually say we don't even care for semantic shift, so we don't, um, if we try to make a comparison with biology, um, then we would say that the direct cognate relation would be orthology, we need to have complete, so no borrowing, no morphological change and no semantic change. This would give us, um, so, um, this would give us what the people uh, in biology call orthology. So it's really clear-cut things without any variation, without any processes, only, only inheritance. And oblique cognate relation would be paralogy, I don't know. But um, we could actually, we have 27 possibilities here by putting the crosses anywhere. But the problem is actually how do we figure out what process was going on if we compare two or more words um, across the language in our data. And this is the first attempt where I try that. I will control for semantics in this approach, but, um, but I will try to show how we can actually get more out of using morphology in the data. But let us just, another example for the different processes. I showed that again. I, I showed that before the example of Indo-European soul and sun. But you can also look at cases like in the European where you have do as a root for to give as in the verb and do not is what is given. given. And this root would be only, uh, one would assume that this, this goes back to in the European. They would use it for that was is given, the present. And uh, in Latin we have donum and dare as two words. And we have donare which makes an, a, a verb out of the noun donum. But the Latin speakers, they did not know that these words are related. So they did not know that data and donum are related going back to the same root. But it's strictly speaking, it goes back. So the words are cognate in this sense. And then if we look further at the processes, we see that French actually used donare in order to make the new word today for to give. So it's donné. And in Italian, we have data, which is to give. So we see that there is a clear process of replacement going on because the French people would really deliberately choose that they do not to discontinue the use of the word data for the, to express something that means to give, but use another word for that, a semantic shift going on there from the word. And, um, but this is not captured in the, in the current databases, because the databases would usually say that all these words are cognate, which is just problematic. A last aspect is um, difference in the processes in semantic change. Um, when the people apply these methods, they say that um, semantic change can more or less be handled. We can just ignore it because we can look only at concept in the same meaning, that have the same meaning. So we just use them and tabulate the data and then have the algorithms decide what was the tree. But uh, we can actually imagine that um, the situation like that, we have time po uh, point one and we have something like the peeping tom. So we look into the, um, through the house and try to see what is going on in the windows. And we hope that they have some light going on there. So we see words like hand and day colored in different colors. So hand and arm and meat. And now we look at the time point two, look again at this and we see that hand and arm are in the same color now, and day and meat are in the same color. So when we, we don't know what's going on inside. And this is actually the approach that is currently being done. Because we do not know what is going on, because we only look at certain semantic slots. But what we should do is actually by uniting them and looking at what was going on in between. Because if we open it, then we could maybe find certain processes that actually lead to this. So sun might replace the word for day, hand and arm might merge and mean the same as it in the Slavic languages, or meat and animal. We find all these cases in the language all over the world. So um, the, the point is actually this approach, what we have, is something like looking at uh, through windows, so, so it's really looking through a glass darkly, and then trying to figure out what was going on. But um, we have the possibility in linguistics to actually look closer at the data and to really look what, at the processes. Shifting the paradigm. Um, lexical change in the Chinese dialects. Yeah, this is... 
Lexical change in the Chinese dialects. If you look at German, English, Danish, Swedish, we find the word for moon. It's easy to handle. So, and I align it here. So, in order to show all the sound correspondences, also our potential. If, um, so, we say if I have one word, so we say it's clear cut case. The words are all cognate. It's no problem. But now, if you look at the word from Chinese, uh, the, law, uh, the, the same words for moon, and, but in uh, four Chinese dialects, so Fuzhou, Meixian, Guangzhou, and Beijing, then we find in Fuzhou, has and Meixian, has Xinyat, Guang. And we find all these cases of variation. And if we align them, it's even impossible to align them properly, the words. Because in this case, we, we don't know what, what does it mean, actually, the alignment. The alignment also only makes sense for the first part, because these all mean, um, uh, this is some statistics. So these all mean moon in the, um, in the language. And this means something like shine and glance or whatever other words. Um, just a little statistics. So by using these words in the data by Hamed and Wang for Chinese, we find 30% of all words are of this structure and 50% of all nouns. So we have a clear-cut problem here because people talk about let's identify the cognates in our data set, put them into an algorithm and then reconstruct a tree. But we see here that it doesn't really work like that. It's 50% of the words uh, exhibit this partial cognacy. So this is just to illustrate the structure. If we have words of this structure and the other, we cannot really model it in, in, in the same application. Like, um, not with, even ignoring the problems that I just mentioned for Indo-European itself. But, um, so in the Chinese dialects, it's really a problem. Furthermore, these processes, these patterns that we see here for the similarity between the words, they could give us hints regarding the development of the dialects. And actually, they give us concrete hints. If you look at Fuzhou, we know it's a Min dialect. It was the first to spread off the Chinese tree, um, if we think of a tree, but of course in the Chinese dialect, but it's the most archaic and the first to spread off if there was a tree-like divergence or in, in the parts that diverge tree -like, in a tree-like way. And then there was an innovation. I think the innovation would be going on here in the new pattern. This would be then the moon light process or um, in, in the Meixi and Hakka case. This was then discontinued in the Mandarin dialect. And what we see in Guangzhou is actually a clear-cut bar because this is a recent word. If one looks at um, older parts of languages, like 50 years ago, it's already not, not the same. So um, these all processes are in the data by looking at the different patterns of partial cognacy. We can infer um, innovations, loss, and borrowings in cases like this. I would jump over this slide because this is uh, not necessarily... This is one way one could handle it in biology, but um, let's go to the point. We cannot model partial cognitive sufficiently when restricting our analysis to binary gain loss models, as they are common in Bi Bayesian phylogenetic analysis. Partial cognacy is too frequent to be ignored, not only in Sino Tibetan languages, but also in other, many other language families Austro Asiatic, Mung Mian, Taikadak. And if we define binary cognacy of basic of common morphemes, the majority of the items in our data sets will become cognate and we will lose a great deal of phylogenetic signal. If we define binary cognacy of the biases of identical morphemes in all words, the majority of the items in our data sets will become non cognate and we will lose again a great deal of phylogenetic signal. Now, look at this case. A means is the morpheme of the word is A. And if, it, if this is also A, that means that they are cognate. So we have the same structure that I just illustrated for the Chinese dialect. So we have AA here, here we have a C and a BB and a D here. If you look at these patterns and we model them in the way that we say, this is different from that, from that, then we would give it four colors. And they don't give us zero, they give us zero phylogenetic information. The phylogenetic analysis doesn't know what was the original word that was used. We don't know anything about that. But now if we do the other, the opposite, we say whenever they share one element only in common, then they all get red. Again, we don't have any phylogenetic information because we do not know which of the concrete terms was the one used in this language, which is an interesting question. Now, when dealing with language families in which compounding morphological derivation is so frequent that it covers more than 30% of the basic vocabulary, we need to incorporate partial cognacy into our phylogenetic models. And this is how we do it. We use a different way to represent the, the, the transitions by using multi-state parsimony and lexical chain. Parsimony is just a... Um, people have been criticizing that, that I don't use the Bayesian approaches because they are better or whatever, but um, in this case, the data is so sparse that we cannot really use it, and it was more for proving a point. But multi-state means essentially that I try to, to define every word that is, it is say, that is different in terms, of this, uh, in terms of its morphological structure, as displayed here, will be modeled as one state in the same slot of concepts. So we have a state AC. And then we can define certain transitions between these states. So we can say, 
To get from AC to ABD is really difficult because we need to lose the C and need to add the B and the D. But if we have an A, getting to AC is rather, sim uh, is rather simple. So A is yellow, A getting to AC is like this. And if we go from AB to ABD, as in the blue case, it's even easier. So from blue to green because we only add one element and most of the times this is a suffix. As we know in the Chinese dialects, usually they add something there. And we can actually model this, and if we use this in order to find the most parsimonious tree, there's only one solution that we can get, and that gives us back to the thing that we know also is true in this case, because the Middle Chinese or the Old Chinese word for, for moon was just this one element. They didn't have multiple morphemes, so they didn't have this compounding structure. We can compare this, also the powerful, so if we use these penalties and we, I, I have some way to compute them automatically because I didn't want to, nobody knows how compounding goes on. This is an open question, I'd say, uh, I uh, an open question in, in, uh, in, um, in language, uh, in historical linguistic, whether there are patterns of compounding that are u universal across language, I don't know. But for the Chinese case, we can more or less have some assumption and we know an AB and can be become so something like that. Can, we can add a suffix or we can lose a suffix, but usually we would assume that it is more adding of elements than losing of elements. Um, then we can actually make a model that we say that we compare two different states of the same character, so two different morpheme structures and say which one is, um, in which direction would the change go. And by using that, we end up for the pattern that I just showed with only one possibility, while we have four possibilities here, even more than that. And here we have already two possibilities if we only show, um, if we show that we have transitions but do not show the direction. So adding transitions reduces the tree space and adding the directions reduces the tree space even more. And then we are actually already close at the analysis that I then took out. So the analysis was just based on modeling the data in this way. And I used 22 Chinese dialect varieties with Chinese character readings. This was provided by the data set by Hamed and Wang. 57 nouns I selected, which ancient Chinese forms ex uh, ex express the concepts that are known to us and also still preserved in at least one dialect. Three reference phylogenies. I tested one by Laurent Sagar, who made a proposal on how the Chinese dialect evolved, one by Jerry Norman, and one by, um, uh, by Yo, um, in Yo 92. I don't. I don't remember his yo, 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 something wrong. And um, four models of lexical change, binary, unrated, weighted, and directed, is in order to compare them. And now we have the different phylogenies. It's not that easy to see. So this southern Chinese is a, um, I compared then how often do they actually give me what we know, because we have old Chinese as an external language that we can actually say old Chinese uh, had the word for moon is this word, and the algorithm will spit out has a tree and we'll spit out which word was the word that was used in old Chinese for moon. So we can compare that and say it's a hit if, we, if the algorithm produces the same word. If it produces another word, it's a fail. And by that we can evaluate the data and say like we have a hit and fail and have different, different cases. And that is what, uh, what is happening here, what you can see. So we um, find that the tree by Jerry Norman gives us something like 0 0.79 with the with a directed approach, so the other approaches are close, going close to, to random, so we find quite something here, but we go even higher if we use the better trees. So we find that the reference trees here is a good uh, indicator, helps us to find better scores, but we also find that the directed models largely outperform all the rest. In this case, we have 82% of um, hits versus 18% of fails, and um, as opposed to um, 76, so in, uh, and 55 if you use um, the simple approach that they currently use for the basic phylogenetic reconstruction. So I think this is evidence enough that we should be really careful when modeling, um, when modeling in um, uh, the data sets in our gain loss models because we lose just too much information. And by adding more information, we can maybe improve also the models on the phylogenetic reconstruction. Now the last point, what I think is interesting about this, I can actually use this in order to illustrate how this, to, 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 to show scenarios how the characters might have evolved. So here you have the different words like moon, moon mother, moon light. These are all like the motivations that then make the words. So in many Chinese dialects they say moon mother or moon father or something like that for moon in order to express a word for moon. Moon bright, moon shite, moon light suffix. And we can then say, so okay, in the ancestral language we have that. Then the algorithm says we have the blue dots. We have the blue dots going on here. Here we have an innovation. This goes on up to the moonshine innovation, goes on up here. The innovation occurs two times, 
Don't ask me why. It may be borrowing, maybe something. But this is something, I mean, the algorithm is there to afterwards figure out what was there. So this can be handed to experts, and experts can discuss um, what we find. And then we have the pattern that we see here. But this is an, a scenario, a solution that is optimal with regard to the um, requiring the least amount of steps and um, explaining most of the data in this way with the um, um, least amount of, um, yeah, uh, of steps and of processes that are going on there. There's an interactive application of this, and I will just click on this if it works and hope that I have internet connection, yes. So in the interactive application, you can, for example, see um, that we have many different scenarios for the word of deck. Uh, but this is just how it works. In phylogenetic analysis, you think 20 trees have more than 10 billion. I, mean, it's, I cannot even number them. 20 trees have so many possibilities. Then think of all the possibilities that could happen if you have the evolution of one word along a tree into different patterns. But we can then what is the main point about this thing is uh, if we look at certain scenarios, I can actually click on them and here I have two possibilities and of the two, the development of the word for egg, which is then reconstructed as to be the word for uh, Ulan, this, this older case, and I click on scenario number two and we can actually here see on the tree what happened. So this is in the Chinese characters, we see here it was retained, retained, whenever it is an innovation, then I note it by, um, by having the double um, around them. So we have the first innovation going on here in the ancestry of them. This is Mandarin but including Gan and, uh, Gan and Xiang dialects where they shift from, from Luan to Dan. So as we have today in Mandarin Chinese in Ji Dan and the chicken egg. So this is uh, an application that's just I think what is important about it is just that linguists can use this and look at it and maybe um, also criticize the approach and say that I took some bad numbers, some bad data, but maybe also learn about more about the patterns of lexical change in the Chinese dialects or in other dialects. So I think now we are here and I think this is already close. The outlook is only um, the typical blah 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 because one needs to always to have this so it's great future and um, we need to be nice to each other and um, we also need to save the environment. And I think here I thank you for your attention. It's like, yeah, uh, I, um, this is actually what Givaudan says in his book on lexical change, which is really interesting, um, I, I think, but it's, it takes some time to, to figure that he, he says, I ignore sound change, because sound change is something that just happens to words and is regular. So by ignoring that, when looking at lexical change, so the continuity between the words is given, no matter w whether they are pronounced differently now. But by, um, and I think it's a good way to, so to, switch that off and not look at that aspect. But of course, you could, people have said, hey, lexical change should add the fourth dimension. But I think Givaudan makes a good point to that. Let's only call that lexical change. The other thing is sound change. So, but you're right. In this case, what is ignored is are all ideas about patterning, about whether the words have uh, aspirated certain parts or have uh, well, other sound well, changes. Well, no, right? the word is things like, uh, which maybe I guess you sort of touched on with, with Yen or A, but you know, you, you take something like true, which is of, with Mandarin the, you know, yes. gonna, if, if you have zhe changes into the, this is a mistake. Zhe right? is still the. Do you understand? If I, if I take the Chinese character approach, you mean? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so we did, yeah, in this case, yeah, um, if you have, uh, this is a coding problem, yeah? If you use a benzi, and this is a problem of the coding problem of using the benzi in Chinese, yeah. uh, Chinese dialectology. Yeah, I, I assume that there may be also a case in the data, because I took the data, so I deliberately did not, I checked the data, and I corrected certain parts, because it was not always explicit what I meant there, to have this way of coding, but it, but it is clear that, um, that 
what we also need is a careful analysis of the Chinese dialect, Chinese data in terms of this, um, of these connections. So if we know that this is um, an, yeah. So just as a, as a methodological sort of starting point, we said, I don't know who wrote this book, but it's, it's all from the Tzu yeah. Yeah. More or less, more or less. I mean, uh, Wang Feng made it. Uh, it's actually he published it in 2004, but since then it's not available online. And uh, he was actually really going through. I want to have a Swedish list of the dialects, so he was looking 20, 20 dialects, and then he was coding them oh, himself so for cognacy. Oh, so it's, it's not from the way. No, it's, it's from this Wang. It's from Wang Feng, and Wang Feng used just the tradition. I mean, I think he's actually more informed because he would actually override certain things where you have different characters in terms of Benzi, and he would say these are still related. So I found certain cases where he says that. But the question is also to which degree... Following his, his cognizance judgments at the morphemic level. Yeah. Which is, let's say, compatible with the Benzo approach. Yeah, more or less. But of course, it's, I mean, this is something that is important to be, to be kept in mind also that... Uh, I mean, as, yeah, as you also, if the data contains certain things, then um, an algorithm can be as shiny as it wants. If the data has certain things that don't work, then um, <laughs> it says, I think in this case, more like, for example, I, I have my suspicions also that uh, I think Wang Feng tried to, um, I think he d didn't even try to, to tag for borrowings. But there are many things that are going on there that are laterally transferred, I think. There are some inconsistencies. So if a pattern evolves two times in the same way, I think it's rather unlikely. And it looks more like there are borrowings going on in the data. And then, unfortunately, he only gave the characters. I couldn't even check the sounds, so I couldn't really. Oh, so he, your data doesn't even have to. Yeah, if you see the original data, it's uh, it's um, it, it's a bit it's a bit difficult. I mean, I understand. So it was not the purpose of of this, but it's actually I think nowadays one would it is better to do it um, than differently. I think in these cases it's, it's really important to think whether when he's really talking about cognacy or, um, or independent development. And we have m many more instances where we just don't know. So we could say, uh, I mean, the people use this and use grammatical data usually in the typological databases. They use them as saying, like, if we have SVO in this language and SVO in the other language is cognate, or it's, or it's potentially. But Chris, is it really cognate? I mean, is it really going back to the same development? This is a problem with structural data that one always has. But if one has structural data that is, um, I think what is really also needed here, the main idea here is to say, we linguists have some idea about directions of processes, and directions give us valuable information. So if one has an idea on morphosyntactic patterns, for example, that you know that this pattern can only evolve if, if the, before it was something like that, or it can only go in this direction, this is a valuable, um, this, this should not be thrown out. So the, the computational people usually claim, no, let the data decide, the data will decide everything. I'm thinking, why let the data, so it's like, um, we, well, uh, it's also we need to, um, like the algorithms also need to be guided by us. If I, if I, if I buy these automatic um, vacuum cleaners and put them in the wrong room and then say, oh, it didn't clean up here, and then, then I complain about that, it's also not. So why not open, open all the doors for them? So that is something what I, what I, but so in this case, I think I need to be carefully state what one, I think in terms of modeling, what is important in, in all structural features is what does one think is actually going on when looking at the patterns. So here in the Chinese case, I already have my problems. I look at the pattern, which I, which I like to show, but then what does it mean? What does it mean? I know, uh, and I ask some linguists, do you have an idea if you, you see these terms? And I ask other linguists of Chinese linguistics, and I say, well, I don't know. We don't have an idea on how com change of compounds goes on. So is there an idea on what is going on in morphosynthesis? Morpho but what is interesting there, if one doesn't have an idea, one could maybe use this to create hypotheses. 
So, for example, fixing the tree, as they say, so having a phylogeny, and then look in what one finds, and look in, does it make sense what the algorithm finds as patterns? Because here, nobody could tell me, nobody's ever looked at, at lexical change in, com in terms of comma, not, not nobody, but really rare, the amount of people who have been doing that. I think for morphosyntactic pattern, so typological features, the same. So, it depends. Ideally, one would just try to also maybe ask linguists or maybe discuss do we actually know the direction between these two things and what does it mean? And uh, yeah, in VARS there's a feature small vowel inventory, medium vowel inventory, and large vowel inventory. And um, what does it mean <laughs> in terms of change when you plot it on a tree? So the people would say maybe it needs to go from medium via medium, from small to large, but then some linguists have their objections against that and give always examples. So. <laughs> yeah. is, is this tree just based on, on the moon example? Or is this there like based on more than uh, This more? tree is based on the intuition of Laurent Sagan. <laughs> so in this case, I, again, I took the trees that are already there. So it was just proving, so it was not that I proved the point that we can reconstruct better trees, but I just took the trees in order to see how the patterns evolve then, in order to show that even we can model the evolution of the patterns. The next step would be to use this method, if it, it turns out to be good, to reconstruct trees itself. But here it's actually based on Laurent Sagan, who has some idea and some innovations. Uh -huh. So that's not the computer that... No, the computer filled out the slots in order to say what was present in which point. So which word was was there? But which tree came out best? Laurence. Laurence. I, I mean that is just uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, so actually I keep trying to. Because you were working in the same office as him. I, I keep trying to show that the tree maybe has. <laughs> I shouldn't say that on YouTube maybe. <laughs> no, but. Uh, I, I, I really independent there, but um, I, of course I'm glad if I find something that conform, confirms tree, but uh, to be honest, I, so far it's always Laurent's tree that turns out best. And it's different data sets that I've been using. Uh, in, another in another study, where, uh, where what I did, it was it had an incredible impact. And actually, there are things we cannot handle in trees at all because we have this language, the, as we in German would say, the Dachsprache, that is like roofing all the other languages, like this roof language. And uh, I mean, you find when comparing data sets from the 50s on the dialects, and one finds that, for example, in Shanghai, there's the word for for, for sun is something like nito, I think. I uh, don't really get the tones and the pronunciation, but uh, nowadays it tell, it's, tell, it's a Mandarin word, what they use now. So they have been replacing, they use both words now. So, and you find lots of doublets in the data already now. So it's really, it, during the last 40 years or 50 years, things have been changing inc incredibly there. And, and why should that be maybe even differ different in the past? So let's say 1800, where they had different overarching languages or languages that were, um, that were more present. So this is a problem and this is also this would be the next step. Now we can handle that lexical change and it goes on but then we could actually search for patterns that show us something that we do not expect. In this case I would for example look for the case what does it mean that we have a parallel shift going on here in the languages. Is it that the tree is wrong? Is it that these languages invented it? And as you say it's like actually it's a normal Mandarin word or more or less like a Mandarin including the Xiang dialects. So it's more like really the northern dialects and the innovation. We know that they have some influence, so it's, it's quite, quite likely that we have a borrowing going on here. structure that occurs in, in 
in those contexts, the two languages, which is abnormal synchronically in that language, then you can say that's an imperative piece of syntax. I thought I think that's a very nice. Uh, yeah. You know, but it's a lot of work. It's, yeah, it's more work than assembling a set of features and then mapping their own language and then comparing yeah. afterwards. Because there you need to look for the irregularities in the languages already. Yeah. No, but I agree with that. If you really want to go for the homology or for the cognacy between these elements, then one needs to go that way and then really decide. Or one uses trees. I mean, trees are also, they serve one purpose. And one purpose of the purpose of the trees that is useful is that trees can help us where we don't know the history. So if we do not know semantic change, but we have a set of cognates, and then, then um, we, we do not know about the directions, the preference direction of semantic change. We can try to f have a computer figure out what was the most probable solution, or what are general patterns that we find there. And I think it's useful. And um, or in, uh, in sound change, we know most of the time, we know the directions. We know a P becomes an F more likely than an F becomes a P. And, um, but, but in other cases, like where we don't know, it's, um, this is the other possibility then. But for that, it's important that the things are related. Um, so we cannot prove any relationship with that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matis, for this.